Good evening all. Welcome to the webinar of guiding. Please confirm if you all can hear me and the screen is also visible to you. You may use the chat window and just respond to my yeah, is it clear? Okay, all right. And one more request, uh, I request you all to please stay on mute unless you have any you know, questions. And even if you have any question, please use the chat window. We can have a Q&A session towards the end of the session, right? So, request you to all. Yeah, everyone is on mute. So, today we have a webinar on, <coughs> today we have a webinar on bagging. Today we'll be discussing about bagging. Bagging is uh, another, you know, one of your ensemble techniques. So ensemble techniques is yeah. Please stay on mute, everyone, unless you have any question. So ba bagging is one of the ensemble techniques that you have. So what do you mean by ensemble techniques? So bagging, you can say it's an extension. Bagging is an extension to your decision tree. Your decision tree. So we all know, I mean, the participants who all have completed the data science course, they all know everything about this decision tree. Decision tree is nothing but your one of the supervised <coughs> machine learning techniques, right? So it's predominantly used for classification. It's predominantly used for classifying. Classifying is nothing but you have a problem statement wherein you have to either, you have two classification, whether the person is a defaulter or not a defaulter. In that way, you have <clears throat> a lot of observations are there and each and every observation has to correctly be classified as defaulter or not defaulter. So it could be two classifications or more than two classifications. It can also be used for regression technique. This can also be used for regression. But mostly, dominantly your decision tree is used for classification technique. So what is the enhancement that we have in bagging or any other ensemble technique that we do not have in your decision tree? Your decision tree <coughs> is nothing but a tree. You have got, it's nothing but a, uh, you know, set of rules that has to be followed. So whenever a new, it's nothing but a, uh, you, you create a tree in this format, you have got different one parent node and then you have got child nodes and within child nodes you all again have child nodes so in this way we have got terminal nodes branch nodes and root nodes so it is nothing but a set of rules that you will have to check or follow whenever a new observation comes in right so it's again <clears throat> you know it's reducing the computation burden by reducing the number of rules but the drawback of your <coughs> decision tree is one drawback that we have over here is it overfits the model right it so what do you mean by overfitting it overfits the training model so what do you mean by overfitting overfitting is nothing but <coughs> Excuse me. You make the models, you know, so complex. The training model that you build, you build the model using the training data, right? So the training model that you build is so complex that the new observation, the unseen data, which is your unseen data either coming from your test data or you know which is outside your test data it is not able to 
this particular model is not able to correctly classify the observation. Right? That is the problem. <coughs> because you can just imagine that as you, uh, you know, we have got stars and we have got circles, stars, circles. Star is there, circle is there. So, these are nothing but the two classifications that you have in your model. So, what you're doing is, if you have to correctly classify exact classification that you get, what you can think of is, this is your classifier, right? Here, it is able to <coughs> correctly distinguish between the circles and the stars, which are the classifications like defaulter and non-defaulter but then the model is very complex right it's, it's too complex and it, it, it will overfit what happens when a, when a new observation comes in whether it is a star or a circle whenever a new observation comes in that will not be properly classified <laughs> so that is the problem with your decision tree it overfits and so it has to stay on mute now, how do we overcome this problem? This problem can be overcome using ensemble methods. So, what is ensemble method? Let us uh, also discuss about what exactly is your ensemble method. Ensemble methods or techniques are nothing but <coughs> you do not build one model. You do not build one model. You build multiple models. Based on some technique, you use some technique and you build different models on the different training data, different samples. Then you get one classifier, another classifier, another classifier. In this way, you would be getting six different classifiers, six, over here I have considered six models. So you will be getting six different classifiers. Now the output of all those six different classifiers can be <coughs> same or can be different. But when you take some computation like average or some other technique to arrive at the final classification, yeah, from these all classifiers, you will be, be coming up with one classifier using some technique. Maybe it's a mean or some other use of some technique, XYZ technique. This classifier is more reliable, is more reliable when compared to the single classifier that you have to. So rather than building a single decision tree, you are building multiple models, multiple decision trees over here using different techniques. In ensemble method, methods, you have got a lot of techniques. One of them is bagging. And uh, you know, when compared to a single model that you're building using decision tree, you are building multiple models in your ensemble method using bagging technique. And that classifier is much more reliable and accurate than compared to the single classifier that you have built which may overfit the model. Most likely it is uh, found that that model will overfit. So this bagging technique, you have got boosting, within boosting, you have got multiple techniques within boosting, then you have got you know <clears throat> other ensemble techniques as well, which are nothing but your like your XGBM is there, the gradient descent is there. In this way, you have got a lot of ensemble techniques which will, which are nothing but when I mean, if you closely look at the hackathons like your or from Kaggle mostly, or also you can use uh, any other hackathon website like Analytic Media. If you look at the techniques which are being followed by the winners, the top three winners, you can find that 
they are following this ensemble methodology right this is much more reliable and much more accurate rather than you building a single classifier sure so this is about a quick overview of what exactly ensemble methods or ensemble techniques is next we'll you know get into the details of your your bagging but before that we also need to understand the technology or the technique rather you know based on which bagging works that is called as bootstrap now what is bootstrapping so we often hear bootstrapping in data science but we get confused when you know when we try to recall what exactly is bootstrapping because the word itself is slightly difficult to remember so it is a very simple technique in order to understand bootstrapping let's you know understand it using an example so what it says is bootstrapping bootstrapping is a powerful statistical method for estimating quantity of a data sample so it's a statistical method that you'll have to remember the terminology and this quantity this quantity could be anything any parameter your mean your median your standard deviation your variance or anything anything it may be. so in order to estimate that particular parameter of quantity bootstrapping is a powerful statistical method and this is easiest to, uh, to understand if the quantity is a descriptive such as mean or standard deviation fine now let's assume that we have got a sample of 100 values right so we have got uh, you know gmat scores gmat scores is what we have and we have got values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 for 100 students, right? Now, we are interested in looking at the mean GMAT score. Mean GMAT score. So, we want to get the estimate as accurate as possible. The accurate, I mean, the estimate has to be reliable as well for different samples. So, say there was a population. We all know that sample mean will be different from the population mean, correct? So, based on the central limit theorem, we all know that the sample mean will be different for the population mean. So there's a population data. Say the population data has got one lakh one lakh records. Out of those one lakh records, you have just drawn a sample of hundred, right? So your your sample mean will be you know, different from the population mean. Yes, of course, like this will be different. So you have collected, you have drawn a sample of 100 values, 100 GMAT scores, and you have computed the simple average, mean, right? You have computed average value. Now that average value will be some value, one, two, three, number, some number is what you will get. We know that our sample is small and that our mean has error in it. Since your sample that you have drawn over here is just 100 out of 1 lakh observations, it is small and this is what we can afford one lakh or sorry 100 observations so you know that there will be some error in your sample now in order to get the mean uh, i mean the correct estimate of that sample all you can do is you can draw different samples draw different samples so what i did is i created thousand random samples right from the data set so i have drawn thousand different samples of size 100 so n over n is small n over here is 100 i have drawn thousands of samples and i have computed thousand means u1 u2 u3 and so on till u thousand now can you not take a grand average average of all the averages is going to give you some average because over here you will have some error i mean the mean value will be different here the mean value will be different here the mean value will be different most likely it will be different so the mean value that we finally get it will be more accurate and reliable when compared to a single mean value right so all we have to do is collect the average of all the means that is going to be the estimated mean of the data right so that is nothing but your bootstrapping method with any quantity 
this is the way how it works and it says that uh, we use three samples and we got the mean value as 2.3 4.5 and 3.3 but take the averages of these value to take the estimated mean of the data to be 3.367 so this average that you see over here 3.367 is much more you know accurate and reliable than these three different averages so this process can be used to estimate other quantities like the standard deviation and even the quantities used in your machine learning algorithms like your coefficients as well so you can use it the bootstrapping it is not just limited to mean median and other uh, parameters but it can be used for any any beat any quantity you can use it so this is based on this technique your guiding works bootstrapping so bootstrapping is you know important uh, terminology when it comes for data science interviews so it will be asked and we very often get confused as to what exactly your bootstrapping is <coughs> So let's understand how bagging works based on bootstrapping. So bagging actually stands for bootstrap aggregation. It actually stands for bootstrap aggregation and bagging is just a short name which is given to it. It's a powerful ensemble method. It reduces overfitting. It reduces overfitting. So whenever you see overfitting in a model, for example, if you have built a model, so you have built a decision tree or uh, support vector machine classifier or any other classifier and you have found that your test data is not properly responding to the model right or the model is not properly responding to the test data either this so you have built a model m1 using the frame data and what happened is your model is not properly able to classify the classification on your test data or the unseen data it means that the model is very complex. It is overfitting. The accuracy of training data is something else, whereas the accuracy of your test data is something else altogether. <clears throat> then in that case, you can use blindly use bagging technique. It will certainly reduce the overfitting problem. So how it works is it combines the predictions from multiple machine learning algorithms. So over here, it is exactly similar to the bootstrapping aggregation method that we just have discussed so what it does is it trains multiple models it, it, it just not relies on a single model then so bagging you will be building multiple decision tree so this is one decision tree you can build thousands of decision trees in this way you will be building multiple decision trees decision tree 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and over here we are not stopping the tree uh, you know in between we are allowing the build, uh, tree to build to the largest extent possible we are not pruning it so because even if it overfits if, if for example if this particular decision tree is overfitting that's not a problem because I am not relying on this particular decision tree I'm looking at all the hundred or thousand decision trees that I'm building, right? So even this is overfitting, even this is underfitting, that's not a problem. So you will be allowing this tree to build to the largest extent possible. So the bootstrap aggregation is general procedure that can be used to reduce the variance for those algorithms. What is variance? Variance is nothing but your overfitting. It is another terminology used for your overfitting. An algorithm that has got high variance are decision trees. Decision trees, you can you can expect this question in interview as to which is that algorithm which has got the tendency of overfitting. So you will be given multiple two to three algorithm names and you will be asked to choose any one or either two. So decision trees, algorithm which has the tendency of overfitting. So decision trees are sensitive to the specific data on which they are trained. If the train data is changed, example, a tree is trained on a subset of the training data, right? So what happens is you are building, you are not you using it, you know, this particular data and you are building a tree. So this particular tree knows everything about this data. But as and when the test data, this is your train data, as and when the test data comes in, it behaves weird. It may predict the values 
security aspect it is not that it always <coughs> behaves weird but it is more likely to behave weird and it you know overfits it will not able to correctly classify so that is a problem that is a challenge with your decision tree so to overcome that challenge we have got different on phone bill methods bagging is one of them so bagging is based on bootstrap aggregation wherein you what you do is you collect predictions from different models so it's a classification technique you have got observations in this way you have got lots of observations so you have got the thousand observations in your test data so this is defaulted this is non defaulted this is defaulted non defaulted defaulted non defaulted defaulted and that way you have got different classifications now this is coming from one decision tree first decision tree in this way you will also get the predictions from all the 100 or the 1000 or 500 decision trees that we have created right so over here you will be getting the of the prediction for the first observation default or non default or default or non default in this case finally what you do is you will be selecting since it's a classification technique the output variable of interest is categorical so you cannot take a mean over here can you take a mean it's not at all possible to compute the mean of the classification the prediction so what you do is you take a mode so if you have more number of non defaulters that will be considered the first observation will be considered as non default and similarly for the second observation you will have 500 different prediction models prediction outcomes non defaulters defaulters so the total the proportion of defaulter is more than that particular classification will be assigned to the second observation in this way classification gets assigned so this is for regression tech uh, sorry classification technique what happens for regression this decision tree can also be used for or bagging can also be used for regression analysis so if you are predicting any output variable of interest which is continuous in nature and what you can do is you can take a simple mean so your decision tree first model will have one prediction or rather i'll write it in this way we have got m1 we have got m2 we have got m3 and so on with m500 okay so from this model you what you do is you get some value 60.5 here you get another value which is 5.4 there you get another value 62.3 in this way you will get different values finally what to do is you take an average of all these values which is going to be the value of the first observation right rather than just relying on this particular value or this value or this value one decision tree outcome you are taking an average which is more much more reliable than the individual predictions so that is how it uh, works so it's slightly similar to your random forest but then in random forest what happens is the decision trees that are built are not using the entire data right so let me also explain you the difference between the random forest and bagging so before that let's, let me just give you an example of this let's assume we have a sample data set of 1000 instances and we are using the classification and regression technical algorithm the bagging of the classification and regression work as follows create 100 random samples of our data set with replacement you can either select with replacement or without replacement but it is i don't say if the data set is small then you will have to select with replacement because you may not be getting 100 random samples without replacement if the data set is small so i'm selecting with replacement i'll build a classifier on each and every training data so you have got 100 different samples over here and from those 100 different samples what you do is you build 100 classifiers right so that is what it is saying give a new data set calculate the average prediction of each one for example if you had five bag decision tree that made the following classification as an input sample over here it says that color is what you have to classify you have got blue 
coming in from the first classifier again you're getting blue then you're getting red you're getting blue and you're getting red so what is that you're going to select from here for the first observation the mode of this the result is blue so blue will be assigned as the label for output label for the first observation right so this is what it is saying so when bagging with decision trees we are less concerned about individual trees yes you have to be less concerned with the individual trees because it's going to overfit the training data yes even if it is overfitting the training data you're not just relying on the individual tree right you have built a lot of trees you have built a lot of trees so you, you should not concentrate on each and every individual tree as you have got hundreds of trees over here so what you can do is even this tree is overfitting or this tree is overfitting you don't have to concentrate because ultimately towards the end what you do is you take an average or the mode in order to get the classification label for that reason you, you do not perform any pruning or any stopping of the you know building of the tree so those things are not done over here in your ensemble methods you allow the tree to build to the largest extent possible so for this reason and for efficiency, individual decision trees are grown deep and trees are not pruned. These trees will have both high variance and low variance. So you can expect underfitting. Very simple model. Very simple model which gives you very low accuracy and you also have got overfitting model. Right? So in this way, these trees individually will have both high variance and low variance. But then ultimately you will be getting a model final classifier the final classifier which is the outcome of these uh, classifiers will be having a proper balance between variance and bias between your overfitting and underfitting so it will take care of that you will not have any overfitting or underfitting problem in this final outcome the only parameter when bagging decision tree is the number of sample strengths the number of samples that we have to choose and hence the number of trees to include so these are the two things that you'll have to concentrate as parameters of your bagging decision trees is first one is the number of samples and second is number of decision trees so each decision tree will have those samples so you have got a thousand samples, thousand observations you're picking up from one lakh observations. Then what you do is you build hundred decision trees. These hundred each and every decision tree will have got hundred or thousand observations. So it, it depends upon the you know the data that you have, number of features that you have. You may have 20, 30 features if you're including all those features, if they are relevant enough then you will have to include them and it will be computationally expensive when it when i say computationally expensive it will be time consuming if you are going with very large sample size and more number of trees so you have to find an optimal value by doing a trial and error for the number of trees and the number of samples so this can be chosen by increasing the number of trees on run after the run accuracy begins to stop showing improvement so very large number of models may take a long time to prepare but will not go with the training data so for that reason you will have to be slightly patient when you deal with your ensemble methods so let me implement bagging in r so we have a data set over here this data set is about the mushroom data set this data set is about mushrooms so there's a repository uci machine learning repository 30 years ago mushroom hunting otherwise known as your showing gained popularity right so it gained popularity this showing technique why it gained popularity is because it learns which features spell certain death and which are most palatable in this data set of mushroom characteristics it is nothing but over here you have got two categories you have got around 23 features in your uh, data set and you have got two classifications either 
edible or what, what is the other thing poisonous so you have to correctly classify the mushroom as either edible or poisonous now we have got the uh, different i mean this is a uh, you know these terminologies we see over here agarsius and decuota are nothing but the family of mushroom so these are the med medical terms and this data set is from 1981 each species is identified as either edible or poisonous so like you have got uh, if you recall the k nearest neighbor algorithm you have got a data set to correctly classify between the benign and malignant tumor yes benign and malignant similar to that data set we have got mushroom data set wherein you have got edible or poisonous mushrooms so it has to correctly classify between an edible or a poisonous data set uh, or poisonous mushroom so let us go to r studio and let us employ the same thing in your r studio and let us see how is it different how is your individual decision tree different from the uh, this thing the guiding outcome so let me quickly open it just a We got it. So here, what happens is, let me just uh, import the data set. I'll show the data set to you after it gets loaded to our console. So the data set is in the form of CSVs for that reason. I'm using a read.csv function, but this is my data set. So let me look at the mushroom certificate. So this is what you have. You have got class. This is the output variable of interest over here. This is your output variable of interest. Two classifiers, either P or E. Cap dot shape, cap dot surface, cap dot color, bruises, order, bin attachment. There are a lot of you know features which are there. Bin size, stock shape. Based on which you will have to correctly classify between a poisonous and an edible mushroom, right? This this A U K and this stands for some terminologies. So it is you know for the sake of discussion, we are not including those terminologies over here. So they stand. For example, this C is standing for something, and this O P order over here. You have got P A I P N A. So these stands for something. So all we have to do is we have to build a decision tree, uh, or rather bagging model to. Correctly classify between the poisonous and edible mushrooms. So let us look at the summary. All right. <clears throat> so this is our data set, mushrooms data set. So let me also show you the summary of the data set. The summary of the data set is going to give you <coughs> the summary for each and every. Feature, but over here, since you have got the features which are in the form of your, you know, the categorical data, for that reason, you're just getting the proportions over here. You can see the proportions. These are nothing but the levels that you see over here: cap, surface, F, G, S, Y, and these are nothing but the proportions. Proportion of observations that each and every categorical variable is taking, right? So if it were Numerical variable, then you would have got the values of minimum value, maximum value, first quartile, second, uh, you know, median, mean, third quartile, and so on. Right? Since it's a categorical data set, you are getting proportions. Now, you also need to first of all, before you start working on any data set, you'll have to find out if there is any missing value in the data. So this is our data. We do not know. We have got 8,124. Observations, we do not know where you have to put the missing value. If I just run this line of code, it should give me the NA values. 
it says that none of the variables has got a weight uh, any value it's giving the count as zero none of the variables have got any values but when i you know inspected the data set closely i was it was found that they were any value i mean the any values in the sense it was not written as na <coughs> but it was a <coughs> excuse me it was not written as any only if it was if it's written as any you will be getting the na count over here but what if, if you have got another any other special character special character like comma or nothing your question mark or something like that then it's also a nothing but it's also your it's it's, it's equal to the na value right so probably in your uh, competitions in your Kaggle competitions or any other hackathon you can expect this kind of a scenario wherein your variable is taking any special character instead of any so you have to yeah yeah we'll we'll come down we'll come to that next time just a while <coughs> so so you can you know using this uh, function you can just look at the levels since it is a categorical variable every variable will uh, categorical data set every variable will have got the levels so here you can see that you have got the levels but you, and in one place you can see the 12th of 12th variable not the observation this talk dot root is taking question mark so this talk dot root is taking a question mark this question mark is nothing but a NA value so wherever you have a question mark it has to be imputed properly right so for that reason what I'm doing is since it's a categorical variable I'll have to either use some other imputation technique or I can go with mode so I just resorted to mode so this is the function which is going to give me the mode of any categorical variable so I'm trying to find out the mode of mushrooms dollar stock output which is the variable which contains that question mark so it was found that p is the mode over here so what I'm doing is Request it to please stay on mute, friends, if you do not have any question. Now, we have got the mode, which is B. So, all you have to do is you have to replace the question mark with B in that particular variable. So, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, replacing it over here. So, this is nothing but going to give me the question marks. <coughs> I'm sorry, the levels. And I'm replacing the first level that is the question mark with B. When you replace it and when you recheck the levels, you will just have ECER. Now you will not have any, you know, NA values. So NA has imputation has been done and you can look at the structure. The structure is giving you ultimately now comes the question of Lakshmi Khan. Uh, do we have to convert it to factor, factor variable? Now <coughs> it has automatically considered all the variables as factor variables on its own. So we don't have to uh, specifically, you know, uh, mention or declare any variable as your factor variable right so each and every variable has got some levels at the max you have got 12 levels over here for gil dot color right so each and every variable is factor variable so you don't have to do that now you can look at the structure dimensions it has got 8.24 and 32 variables that is fine now what I'm doing is I'm computing the prior probability. Yeah, most of the for you know most of the, the variables it converts or it <coughs> considers as a factor variable. As and when it you know it did not consider any categorical variable which was supposed to be a factor variable, then you'll have to forcefully convert it using the factor function or as well factor. Right? So here number of classes this function is going to give you the number of classes which are present so it says that it is again nothing but giving the levels and computing the proportion of each and every this thing for each and every uh, level of each and every variable see over here you are getting the proportion that each and every uh, level of the categorical variable is taken we have got 20 features the habitat it's taking these many levels and these many levels d is taking 38 percentage of the data 38 per per percentage proportion so if you want you can look at these proportions or else it is not required now you know we are not going to getting into the details of your exploratory data analysis because our objective is to 
compute the bagging model, compute the individual decision tree, and just to compare the differences, how is it different, right? So I'm not getting into the details of how you have to create the histograms, how you have to check the patterns of the data, and all those things, right? So let me build a simple decision tree using C5.0. So I'm using the caret package. Caret package has that uh, function, which can you know quickly be, give me a training and the status. So what I'm doing is I'm also uh, using the set dot c function to get the same results again. If I run this kind of code once again. So caret has been loaded. Set dot c executed. So what I'm doing is from this mushroom dollar class. We have got this mushroom dollar class. This, if you just run this table of mushroom dollar class over here, you will be getting the proportion of the output variable mushrooms dollar class. So you have got 4208 as the E classification number of observations as E that is edible and poison as 3916. So you do not have a lot of difference between the proportions. So <coughs> from these proportions, I'm using 80% of the data in my partition. So that is going to be under partition. So it's going to create the partition. And <coughs> all those rows of those mushrooms, I'll be selecting them in the training data. Now, if you look at the proportion of, or rather, table of your uh, training dollar class. You get to see that the proportion are almost the same 3367, So it's maintaining the proportions even in the training and test data. So the dimensions of your training happens to be predictive variables with 6500. So you have got 8124 observations out of 8124, 6500 have been considered in the training data. So the leftover will be in the trade test data. So let me execute this kind of code as well. Test. So, <coughs> so here you can see that the <coughs> test data has got 1624 observations and the proportion percentage is 52 and 48. That is, you know, very good. If at all, if the proportion percentage is not good, then you will have to employ the imbalanced classification techniques to get the proportions same or approximately the same. Now, let us employ C5.0 and build a decision tree. Uh, C5.0 is already installed, I believe. Yeah, so I'm invoking the package and I'm building C5.0 train dollar class is my output variable of interest. And I'm using all the input variables using the dot over here. And I'm not giving the classification over here. Train of minus one is you know not giving the class variable to the data. From this, I'm building a model. Okay, now that model. <coughs> it's used to predict the values. So it says that C5.04 called with exit is value 1. Okay, fine. So what happens is, I'm ex uh, apart from just excluding first variable, I'm also excluding the 17th variable. The reason being, let me just uh, check what is the name of the 17th variable. The building variable happens to be real type and what is it real type? Here it is. Real type. So what, what what's happening over here is they if you do table of uh, mushrooms of real type. It is taking only one value. So in your data set, if you have got any variable which is taking only one value, that is not going to add any pattern or any, it's not going to be significant to the model. So better we drop it, right? So I did not notice in the beginning. So what I'm doing is I'm removing this 17 from my analysis along with my first output variable. Then I'm building the model once again. The model has been built. We can use this plot of model and, you know, if, if I just use this plot of model, it will, it's going to give me the decision tree in this format. We have got a decision tree <coughs> in this format. 
for this particular data set. Then you can also use this pretty equal to zero, adding the labels. Now I'm interested in the predictions. So using the predict.c 5.0, which is present in your caret function, caret package, I'm predicting the classifiers of my test data. Right. So here are my classifications which are saved in your prediction. So we have got E's and P's. So you will create the confusion matrix. Again, this confusion matrix is in your caret data or uh, caret package. So predict and actual. This is your predicted values and these are your actual values. When I run this confusion matrix, I will be getting the output in this format. <coughs> so 841, there's only one misclassification as per the decision tree. As per the decision tree, there's only one misclassification, 841 and 782 are the correct classifications. The accuracy happens to be 99.99, 99.94, and your, it, it, it also gives you the sensitivity. The beauty of this carrot, uh, this confusion matrix from the carrot packages, it gives you all those measures, sensitivity, specificity, positive predicted values, negative predicted values, and so on. So the sensitivity is 1 over here, and specificity is also equals to what more or less the same this is your this is the model that you have built using the decision tree so you often know that the decision tree is you know it overfits the model so what we do is we build an ensemble model which is the bagging model so over here what i'm doing is i'm creating a vector i'm creating a vector of length 101 that is saved in my fit tree object <coughs> Now, I'm again building a vector, another vector, more equal to list, and the length happens to be 101. The first bit tree is a vector to store different back models. So you will be building different models. So here I'm building 101 models. So 101 models will be built over here. That I'm saving in this bit tree. And this test one has 101 samples to be used. This test one has got 101 samples. So let me execute the test one again. Fine. So I have got the two, uh, you know, predictors. Um, to get the same results, I'm using the set dot seed function. Now I'm running a loop for loop for 101 times. So it will give me 101 decision trees over here. And every time, what happens is. You, it creates a partition data every time it creates a new sample and on that sample a decision tree will be created and on that <coughs> you will have to predict your values so you can see over your feed dot tree of i so i is ranging from 1 to 100 and you will be getting 101 decision trees and you're not stopping it anywhere it has to uh, you know build a decision tree to the deepest you know extent possible so i'm just executing these lines of code it will take uh, slightly some time, probably you know 20 30 seconds to execute this 101 models. <coughs> I'm not using this uh, first variable, output variable, and a 17th variable, which is not required. Right. Okay, now, after it builds build the model, we are going to predict them. Uh, predictions first. again those predictions will be 101 it's taking some time probably in another 15 20 seconds it should get completed So this fit tree is used to save the models, whereas your test one is, to, is used to save the samples. Nothing but the samples, the random samples that you have picked for your building the models. Fine. It has built all the 101 decision trees. Since I have taken this 101 as a sample, it has taken you know very less time to <coughs> build those decision trees. But in real time, if you are taking the sample size, if it is bigger, then it will take some more time. So 
viewers from this bit tree, you will get to see all those 101 decision trees over here. <coughs> see, decision tree 100 is the model. Number of samples 6500, number of predictors 31. In this way, it has built all the 101 decision trees. And let me also show you the test one. If you run it. So it's taking the, <coughs> this is the data that was taken for you. Test one. 101 samples. Now all you have to do is you have to get the predictions, predictions for those 101 models, confusion matrices for those 101 models, and accuracies of those 101 models. Right? So we have to get three things: predictions for each and every model that you have built 101. Confusion matrices and accuracies. So again, I'm building three different vectors: red one, confusion one, accuracy one. Right? We <coughs> are taking the time. So probably I can stop it. Let me just stop it. It has just created 68 uh, test one samples. So what I'm doing is I'm creating these three vectors. Now I'm in this for loop. This loop is repeated 101 times, and 101 predictions will be there. 101 confusion matrices will be there. 101 accuracies will be there. That is what I'm doing over here. <coughs> right. So this will take another 30 seconds or 30 seconds, probably, in order to give us the <coughs> predictions, confusion matrices, and accuracies. There are functions as well which are you know already present in order to use the bagging and the boosting algorithm. But this is the manual way which keeps us the using which we'll be able to relate the things so easily. So it has been completed. So let me look at the predictions. So these are the prediction scripts. Predictions of the 101 model. So it is just running. So what I'm doing is I'm just hopping it over here. Because this is this will take a long time. So it's just uh, a 15 this thing, <coughs> predictions. So all these are coming from different models. Confusion matrices. See, 101 confusion matrices. 101 confusion matrices is what we have. Misclassifications and classifications and accuracies. These are the accuracies. So if we have to classify, <coughs> excuse me. If you want to look at the accuracy or class of accuracy, you can see that it is not going to be a simple this thing uh, number. It will be in the form of a list, so you have to unlist and you have to compute the mean of all the accuracies, right? The mean of all the predictions have to be done or more of all the predictions have to be done over here in order to correctly classify. What I'm doing is I'm performing mean over here, mean of all the accuracies, which is going to give me the ultimate final accuracy of the banking model, 99.99, right? So we got an accuracy of 99.94574 accuracy on the test data as well. But in this way, you will have to build the n number of decision trees that you have declared. Is that clear, friends? But before that, you'll also have to ensure that your decision tree, the classification or the proportion of your output variable, proportion of the levels of output variable has to be similar. For example, if you have got two classifications, approximately it should be 50-50, even if it's not 50-50, you'll have 45-55, that is also okay. But it should not be like 20-80, it should not be 25-75, 23-77. This proportion will, you know, what happens is, this will have, this, this proportion, this level will have a greater impact on this particular 
classification. So these classifications will also be classified as, for example, if this is P and this is E, then E's will be also be classified as P's. <coughs> for that, in order to avoid that, you'll have to take care of or employ any imbalanced classification technique. And once that is done, probably you'll be getting 50 to 50 percentage of your classifications or 33, 33, 34 classifications if you have got three class uh, levels. Then after which you can draw the sample and you can, <coughs> you know, employ the bagging model. So all these techniques that you see over here, imbalanced classifications, have to be applied only on the training data. After you draw the sample, after you, so, you know, divide the data set into training and test, you don't have to touch the test data. You don't have to look at the proportion of test data. Test data is an unseen data. It can be anything. You'll have to employ everything on the, you'll have to try every experiment only on the training data. Right? In the classification, all those things have to be worked only on the training data and not on the test data. Otherwise, you'll be getting misleading results. Right? So that is about bagging implementation of bagging in our studio let me know if you have any questions you can unmute yourself or you can use the chat window let me see if i have any questions in the chat window <coughs>
and simple techniques are only used for your supervised machine learning techniques or rotation analysis. Right? So any other any other question, friends? I don't see any question coming in. So we will call it a day. You can reach out to the concerned person if you wish to take the recording. Right? Thank you all friends. Thank you for attending the webinar. Good night.